plant-based peeps. Welcome to another episode of Plant-Based Mafia. Hope you guys are ready for chapter six of Dr. Esselstyn's famous book, Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease. And if you are listening to my podcast and watching my YouTube channel, I beg of you to go and find the people in your life that are suffering from some sort of an illness, especially heart disease. We all have those people in our life, fathers, uncles, aunts, whoever. Tell them to buy the book and to also listen to my podcast and listen and watch my YouTube show. I'm gonna read the entire book, but it's important to have the book as well. You know what? Heart disease can be prevented and it can be arrested and it can be reversed. If you have severe, severe heart issues, you, your heart's never gonna go back to normal, but the progression of the disease can be halted completely. The heart can be strengthened the endothelial wall, the arteries can be strengthened, which will keep you very safe and keep you clean, much cleaner than you already are. And when I mean clean, I mean your body is going to be stronger, your arteries are going to be stronger, your artery walls are going to be more elastic, like a fresh rubber band, and they won't be susceptible to plaque buildup. Um, your organs are going to be clean. Your body's just going to function better. Your mind's going to function better on a plant-based diet. It's science. It's as simple as that. So I'm not even going to debate it. I've listened to medical professionals. I'm not a guru myself. I'm not going to claim to be a guru. But I am absorbing and I am taking in tremendous, tremendous information that is backed scientifically. This stuff works, so I beg of you to please take it serious. All right, so we're gonna jump right into chapter six, and the name of the chapter is Living, Breathing Proof. Don Felton's wife, Mackie, used to get up each morning and fry bacon. Mm, I used to love bacon, and quite frankly, I still do, but I know it's killing me, so I stopped eating it. She used to get up every morning and fry bacon, then make gravy from the grease and serve it to Don over toast or homemade bread. I loved it, Don says. I ate it for years. And it wasn't just a matter of breakfast. I remember side meat cooked in beans. Side meat was pure fat and two inch thick piece of fat off the side of a pig, usually. The side meat is cured in salt, soaked overnight, rolled in cornmeal, and browned in a skillet with gravy made with the grease. Don Felton makes no bones about it. He loved gravy. And really, who doesn't love gravy? Unfortunately, gravy kills. Unless it's a, a nice uh, tomato gravy with no oil. And he loved a lot of other fatty foods as well. He arrived at my office on January 15th, 1986. He was 54 and had been informed by his cardiologist that after 27 years of chronic heart trouble and treatment, including a double bypass that had begun to fail, there was nothing more conventional medicine can do for him. As he walked across the skyway that connected my office with the rest of the Cleveland Clinic, he had to stop three or four times because of acute pain in his leg. An angiogram showed that the main artery in the leg was entirely blocked. Don and Mackie talked with me for two hours about the program he was about to undertake. When they left my office, they stopped at a little Italian restaurant not far away and had a bowl of soup. I guess this is the last good soup we will have, Don said to his wife. But he was, as he says, at the end of his rope. He did not want to take a chance on more surgery. He was committed to my nutrition program and began to follow it that very day. After three or four months, Don Felton's chest pain eased. He no longer had to sleep propped up by pillows to ease the angina, which had been much worse when he laid down flat. And about seven months after he started the program, he mentioned that he had been so focused on his heart that he had forgotten to tell me about his leg. 
He now was able to walk across the Skyway to my office without stopping, without a single stab of pain. I immediately sent him to the vascular laboratory for another pulse volume test, which showed that the flow of blood in the artery had been blocked, was back to normal. To me, Don is a test case in the power of endothelial cells and how they respond dramatically to dramatically reduce cholesterol levels and lifestyle changes that eliminate all risk factors. And it is so turned out, and it's so turned out, were the rest of those who took part in my study. But antidotal evidence of improved health is not sufficient to evaluate the results of this sort of research. I needed serious scientific information on just what was happening to participate in the study as they followed my program over the months and years. Three separate measurements are necessary to evaluate results in this type of research. An analysis of cholesterol levels during the course of the study, analysis of angiograms taken before, during, and after treatment, analysis of the clinical results of the study. Keep in mind, keep in mind the background of 18 patients who stuck with the program all had severe progressive coronary artery disease. In the eight years before my study began, all had received state-of-the-art cardiac care at the Cleveland Clinic. Collectively, they had experienced 49 cardiovascular events, including 15 cases of increased angina, 13 cases of measurable disease progression, seven cases of bypass surgery. In addition, two others in the group had had bypass surgery more than eight years before the surgery began. Four heart attacks, three strokes, two angioplasty procedures, two worsening stress tests. Here's how they fared in my study. Cholesterol. During the first five years of the study, the patient's blood cholesterol was tested twice a month or more. For the next five years, it was tested once a month and after that every three months. The group began the study with an average blood cholesterol level of 246, a level all experts consider to be too high. By adhering to the nutrition program and using cholesterol-lowering drugs, they were able to reduce the group average to 137 milligrams, cutting their cholesterol levels nearly in half. This is the most profound drop in cholesterol levels in such a study that I have been able to find in medical literature, discounting recent studies using mega doses of statin. 12 years after joining the program, every one of the participants averaged total cholesterol below 150, that stated goal of the study. Their LDL bad cholesterol averaged 82 milligrams, among the lowest ever reported in this type of study. Their good HDL cholesterol averaged 36.3 milligrams, which is lower than the range generally accepted as normal, but it was sufficient to sustain the beneficial results. Our research strongly suggests, in fact, that lower than normal HDL levels are not worrisome as long as total cholesterol level is well within the safe range under 150 milligrams. A finding that has been discussed by other researchers as well. Angiograms. A coronary angiogram is specialized x-ray of the coronary arteries. A flexible catheter is inserted into an artery either at the elbow or the groin and advanced toward the heart. At the entrance to the left ventricle, the heart's main pumping chamber, the catheter can be alternately inserted, alternately inserted into each of the coronaries. Dye is injected through the catheter into each coronary artery while running a film sinoangiogram captures a precise picture of the artery and its major branches. When these angiogram pictures are taken over time, it is possible to compare them and thus to measure how diseased portions of the arteries are faring. Are they remaining the same? Are they getting worse, narrowing as, this, as they sustain further blockage? Or are they improving, growing wider, and thus allowing more oxygen and nutrients to reach the heart muscle? These analysis of the films must be scrupulously precise and objective. For my study, all were performed three times. In addition to avoid any possibility of bias, 
the technicians who performed the angiogram analysis were blinded. That is, they did not know whether the film they were analyzing was the initial baseline film taken before the patient joined the study or the follow-up film taken upon its completion. At the five-year mark, seven of the 18 participants were unable to have a follow-up angiogram. The results I report here are for the 11 patients who did have the follow-up angiograms after five years. The analysis were stunning. In sustaining cholesterol readings below 150 milligrams, these patients elimin eliminated any clinical progression of their disease. Every single one arrested progression of the heart disease and eight participants actually selectively reversed it. Some of the reversals were striking. As you can see in the photographs that accompany this text, figure 13 in insert shows a 10% reversal of disease over five years in the left anterior descending coronary artery of a 67-year-old pediatrician. Figure 14 shows a 20% improvement in the circumflex coronary artery of a 58-year-old factory worker. Figure 15 shows a 30% improvement in the right coronary artery of a 54-year-old security guard. And again, the angiogram of Dr. Joe Crow revealing total disease reversal after 32 months. Having an angiographic proof of disease reversal was an, was an occasion of enormous joy for study participants and cause for families, gatherings, and champagne toasts. It was also enormously gratifying for me. It showed beyond argument that the hypothesis and the foundation of the research was solid. We now had irrefutable scientific evidence that the heart disease could be arrested and reversed. And if it can be reversed, it also can be prevented. Clinical results. Before discussing the clinical results, it is important to review that one death that occurred during the study. The patient was a man in his 60s who had severe coronary artery disease. He had been accepted into the study two weeks after sustaining a massive heart attack during an unsuccessful angioplasty. His unsustainable condition persisted, and seven months later, he underwent bypass surgery. His left heart chamber was so badly damaged and scarred that it was able to pump blood at less than 20% of its normal capacity. Such patients have a poor outlook. Nevertheless, this man survived, and after he had spent nearly five years on the program, a follow-up angiogram compared four of the areas where his arteries had narrowed. Two were unchanged, two had improved. Ten months later, he died of cardiac arrhythmia. Post-mortem studies showed no new blockages of the heart, despite the improved coronary artery supply and decrease in angina, his heart, which was so scarred, had literally electrocuted itself into arrest. As for the rest of the groups all improved, nine of the patients had come to the study with angina, pain in the heart muscle, caused by inadequate blood supply. So this is really important too. It's the prevention of getting to where this man was that's incredibly important. I had three clogged arteries. I have four stents in my chest. I got them at 41 years old. I had a nuclear stress test uh, about a year and a half ago and everything looked great. My arteries look great. My heart is very healthy. So what I'm doing right now is practicing prevention. I don't ever want to be where these people are. And by aggressively attacking it now, by aggressively taking this on now, I can reverse, stop, slow down whatever is happening to me by living a very clean, plant-based life existence. And you could do that too. If you're somebody who's eating the typical American diet, I promise you, heart disease is already happening. I don't care if you're 25 years old, shockingly enough, it's happening. There are tremendous studies that show that, e that young high school teenagers just graduating are having plaque buildup on their artery walls, and that's why they're having heart attacks at 40, 50, and early 60s. There's an amazing study that shows Vietnam veterans that were deceased, killed at war, coming home, 
They did all of these autopsies. They showed these young men, 18, 19, 20 years old, already had onset of cardiovascular disease. And it's because of the American diet. So don't think just because you're 25 or 30 that it's not happening. If you have a typical American diet, and that means eating a lot of chicken. If you're someone who thinks that eating a ton of chicken every single day with a little bit of rice and some broccoli is healthy for you, I'll tell you it is not. The science is there. That's a ton of animal protein that you're consuming. Now, if you're consuming a little bit of chicken with a lot of vegetables, and the majority of your food every day are whole foods, and the majority of your foods are plant-based, and you have a little bit of poultry, a little bit of fish, a little bit of red meat, and you're not someone that has any sort of severe cardiovascular issues, then that's probably going to be okay. But if you are someone who's overweight, with diabetes, high cholesterol, um, you have blood pressure issues, you should not be eating like that. You need to make an aggressive change, okay? Because your body is suffering. You don't have time, you don't have months, you don't have years to make those changes. Make them immediately and start the process of changing and reversing all of those things that are happening to you. Because chances are, if you are overweight, you have high cholesterol, you have a diet, you are onset diabetes, you have high blood pressure, and your body is not functioning the way that it should be. So, you know, step up and start taking your health serious. All right, back to the book, enough rambling. It was completely eliminated in two and much improved in the remaining seven, including the patient who died. Exercise capacity improved. Sexual activity was enhanced. One patient confided that the impotence that had long bothered him had been cured in the course of the study. The results have lasted over the years. Don Felton, who could barely manage to walk to my office when he first came to see me, is now in his 70s, fit and active. When I first started, I was down, he says. Now I've been eating this way for so long, I don't think about it anymore. Mackie still makes him gravy, but she makes it with fat-free broth, and he pours it over mashed potatoes. And Don still goes deer hunting every year. But there are few differences from the old days. For one, he takes oatmeal on the trips so he doesn't miss his healthy, healthy breakfasts. For another, he doesn't eat venison anymore. Emil Hugford, once such a prisoner of nitroglycerin, unable to even sleep unless he was in a sitting position, improved quickly after starting to eat right and to reduce his cholesterol. He had worked for the telephone company as an engineer, but had been forced to retire early because of his health. About six months after he joined the study, he came to my office and with tears in his eyes said, if I continue to improve this much, I'll have to go back to work. And despite his wife's worry that he might not make it to their daughter's wedding, he was able to walk her down the aisle after all. 11 years after Emil joined the program, an angiogram confirmed that he achieved some reversal of his disease. Don and Emil, both of whom had undergone bypass surgery before joining the program, the study, teach an important lesson in the downside of that procedure. The vessels used for bypassing blocked arteries simply cannot last forever. Eventually, the scar shut. In Don's case, a vein had been used to bypass his clogged coronary artery. It lasted for 20 years, about twice as long as most vein bypasses, but eventually it had been replaced. In Emil's case, an artery had been used for the bypass and it lasted for, for fully 30 years. At the end of that time, it suddenly blocked, causing a mild heart attack requiring a corrective bypass. In both men, the reversal of the disease in their native coronary arteries due to their compliance during the course of, of our study enabled them to tolerate the required surgery safely. Today, both are well, free of angina or any restriction on their activity. Jerry Murphy, the company executive whose male family members had all died young as far back as anyone could remember, is as I write in his mid-80s, 
during 14 years on the program. He maintained a total cholesterol level below 120 milligrams. The patient who was once called a heart attack about to happen by his cardiologist jogged every day until he was 78. Today, he is beginning to experience a bit of arthritis, something no other male of his family ever had. None lived longer enough to acquire it. Evelyn Oswick, whose doctor had told her to go home, find a rocker, and wait to die, is now in her late 70s. Despite her initial skepticism, once she made up her mind about my nutrition program, she never turned back. And her heart disease, as a result, is completely under control. In fact, today, when Evelyn sees a new doctor, she tells him she no longer has heart disease. With characteristic self-confidence, she declares that anyone who has a heart attack these days is simply foolish, since there's such a solid information on how to arrest the disease. Jim Trusso, who had so much trouble with the program, when he joined the program, stayed with it. His wife, Sue, says that even to this day, he is not a fruit and vegetable person, but he knew that a change in his eating habits was the only way he could save himself. And little by little, he learned to live with the diet, how to season healthy foods so that he grew to enjoy them. Shortly after I wrote the 12 years follow-up report on my patients, Jim joined a charity event bicycling from Cleveland to Ohio and back a round trip of approximately 225 miles. He was definitely overdoing the exercise and sustained a cardiac arrest during the exertion. This was not a heart attack, but rather a case of building up epinephrine through exercise and then stopping suddenly. With his muscles no longer consuming the epinephrine, it caused arrhythmia and Jim's heart stopped beating. He was resurrected resuscitated rather, and an angiogram suggested that he needed a third bypass to more fully protect him and his active lifestyle. His strong constitution withstood the surgery. Now in his 60s, Jim had retired from the education system. He ultimately began superintendent of schools, but he's hardly sitting still. He bikes on the beach every day between eight and 10 miles. He kayaks and lectures and travels the world with Sue. And to this day, he maintains his cholesterol level at 121 milligrams. He won the bet with the doctor who wagered a steak dinner, then he would never get his cholesterol below 305. But he had never collected for obvious reasons. Jack Robinson also made a bet with his cardiologist. Two years after he refused bypass surgery and started my nutrition plan, his doctor in Akron was still deeply concerned about Jack's choice. He suggested the following wager. Jack would have another angiogram, and if it showed further progression of the disease, he would agree to have the bypass. The angiogram did not show disease progression. Quite the contrary, it showed that Jack was reversing the effects of his disease. Ultimately, Jack moved to Ohio, where he signed up with a new cardiologist. Like Jack's old doctor, the new one was skeptical of Jack's nutrition-based approach. And in 1998, Jack reluctantly agreed to have yet another angiogram. This one revealed even further improvements. So much, in fact, that to Jack's dismay, the cardiologist began boasting that it was his drug regimen that had made all the difference. What had occurred with all these people is very basic. The blood supply through the coronary arteries to their heart muscle had improved. In the majority of the patients, the arteries themselves are measurably wider. The profound reduction of the cholesterol had increased the capacity of the endothelium, the arteries inner lining to produce nitric oxide, which in turn dilates the arteries themselves, even diseased arteries. And that's not the only improvement. Recent research indicates that reducing blood cholesterol levels decreases the thickness of the membrane surrounding the red blood cells, thus enhancing its permeability. This allows the red cells to pick up oxygen more readily as they pass through the lungs and enables them to release the oxygen more efficiently as they circulate through the heart muscle. Finally, the patient's plant-based diet, eliminating the ingestion of the foods that injure vascular tissues and restored strength and integrity to the endothelium as a whole. Any plaques in these patients were protectively capped and could not rupture or initiate the cascade of clotting that defines a heart attack. 
these patients are now heart attack proof. Three of the original members of the study have died since it ended. One died of pulmonary fibrosis. The second vomited violently collapsed and died amid copious bleeding about 30 years after he entered the program. No autopsy was ever performed, but because of the vomiting and bleeding, which are not associated with heart disease, I suspect he died of Mallory-Wise syndrome in which a gastric artery is eroded by acid retching. The third was a retired truck driver who fell into a terrible depression, and at the time of his death, he was living in a facility where he couldn't eat safely, and little by little, his health deteriorated. In 1998, I reviewed the status of the six patients who were released from the study in the first 12 to 15 months and returned to their cardiologists and pre-study diet. In every one of them, the heart disease had grown worse. All told, since leaving the study, they had suffered four cases of increased angina, two episodes of ventricular tachycardia, a potentially lethal arrhythmia or disruption of the heartbeat, which causes the heart to race, four bypass operations, one angioplasty, one case of congestive heart failure, one death from complications of of arrhythmia. What a contrast. As I reported, the patients who stayed with the program collectively had sustained no fewer than 49 cardiac events in the years leading up to the study. One man six years into the program went back to his old eating habits during an 18-month period of hectic business activity and his angina, which had disappeared, returned requiring bypass surgery. That was the only case of a new cardiac event among participants in the study during the first 12 years. This was another case of bypass surgery that I learned about while writing the book, but I do not count it as a true coronary event. The patient in question left the Cleveland area two years after joining the study, and I lost contact with him. He continued to follow the program and does even now, 20 years later, but he told me that he insisted upon the bypass surgery in order to Haston relief from symptoms that kept him from improving his tennis. Among the fully compliant patients during the 12 year study, there was not one further clinical episode of worsening of coronary artery disease after they committed themselves to keeping the cholesterol within safe range. All of the patients have continued on their own to follow the nutritional program and cholesterol lowering medication I recommended. Even though the case has ended, As they reflect upon nearly two decades of freedom from disease, these patients are empowered by the knowledge that they have taken control of their own health and have taken into their own hands the treatment of the disease that was destroying their lives. Anthony Yen, whose New York, who New Year's weekend in 1987 nearly turned into a deadly debacle, puts it perfectly. One of his five bypasses had failed just before he joined the study, and he was determined to keep the disease from growing worse. He remembers how tough it was to follow the program at first, having to keep the detailed diary of what he consumed and facing blood tests every two weeks. But suddenly, one day a month or so into the program, Anthony realized he felt dramatically better. I walked in the wind and had no angina, he says. He turned to his wife, Josine, and spoke triumphant words any one of the study participants would endorse. He won the battle. I can't stress it enough. The proof is there. It's scientific evidence. And Dr. Esselstein is still doing this. He's alive. He's kicking his well. Him and his wife... They lecture all over the country, I think all over the world. They have cookbooks. They make the diet easy for you. And they make it sustainable. So I'm begging you, I'm please, I am just pleading with you. If you are in poor health, if you are eating the typical American standard diet, you are going to get cardiovascular disease. You are going to get diabetes. You are going to get blood pressure, blood, blood pressure issues, and you are destroying your body. Make some changes. 
buy this man's book, listen to my YouTube channel, listen to my podcast. It's all about plant-based living. And it's not just about eating food. It's about living the best possible you that you could live. I mean, just a few years ago, I weighed in 375 pounds. I was a sloth. And I had amazing things happening in my life. Amazing things. Amazing friends, great money I was making. I was just breaking into the film industry, starting to live my dream, but I still was a big, lazy, horrible sloth, you know, on a couch, stuffing myself with pizza and burgers, just, well, you know, looking at myself in the mirror, just completely grossed out. I mean, I graduated high school at 165 pounds. All of a sudden, I woke up at 375, a shell of myself. I was this, this massively gross human being that couldn't even connect with the world. So here I am, just a few years later, you know, I've taken on this plant-based diet. I am, my life has changed dramatically. I'm down almost 100 pounds. I'm a completely different human being. I'm running a wonderful media company. I'm doing things that I never dreamed of. And I, I owe it all to changing the fuel that I put into my body. So just think about that. Changing the fuel that you put into your body. Would you buy a beautiful Lamborghini and fill the tank with water? You know, it's a rhetorical question. So follow me on YouTube here. If you're not following me already, subscribe to my channel. And come check me out on SoundCloud. This way, if you're just cruising in the car, you can listen to the stuff that I'm talking about. Um, at Plant Based Mafia, Facebook too, Plant Based Mafia. Uh, my website's going to be launched this Monday, plantbasedmafia.com. And I just want to make it clear I'm not a guru. Uh, I'm not going to claim to have all the answers, but I seek the answers. I go out and I find the answers from the experts in the field. And I'm not talking about these self proclaimed vegans that say they're gurus and they come up with all these crazy things that they have going on. That's not who I am. I'm looking for the doctors and the scientists, the men and women that are creating, that are bringing the science to the forefront of what a plant based diet looks like, what it feels like, how it is changing the body on a metabolic level. That is what I'm looking for. Those are the people that I'm connecting with. And I wanna take that information, I wanna simplify it, and I wanna bring it to you in the simplest terms. You know, I have a lot of people in my life, uh, even my father, who has uh, several clogged arteries, I'm trying to change his way of thinking. I have uh, friends, fathers, you know, that are, you know, sustained several heart attacks. But their cardiologists are just yet, they're just not subscribing to this yet, and it's amazing. But then I have some other great friends that are cardiologists, and they're really starting to open up to this. And there's, there's cardiology clinics all over the country and cardiologists all over the country that are starting to open up to this idea that you really are what you eat. It's such a cliche, that statement, but so profound and deep. So I beg of you, please, please, just start to re just start to do the research to explore it for yourself and just try it give it 30 days and see how you feel so again uh subscribe to me here please uh, on my youtube page check us out in about a week at plantbasedmafia.com you could actually join the mafia uh we are looking for content contributors we want people who have their own stories that are not looking to create their own blog and you know Put a million videos on Instagram. Come bring it to us. Show us your story. Show us the evolution of your life. Tell us your success story. And it's not just about uh, just on the health front. We want to know how changing your healthy life, changing your health, actually helped you transform your personal relationships, help transform your business. Because I have a very strong belief system that once you change your health and you change your the fuel that you put into your body, that all these other things will really start to enhance your personal life, your friends, your social life, your, your relationships, your businesses, the decisions that you make. I believe all of those things will change in a positive way. I believe that when you're eating like this, it's easier to think positive, it's easier to dream bigger, and it's easier to connect. Almost like the laws of attraction, I believe in all of that. I believe all of this is connected. 
So come to the page, plantbasedmafia.com. Uh, it should be up on Monday. And you could come and post your blog entries. You could put pictures. You could show us the food that you're eating. Talk to us about the businesses that you're starting and how a healthy transformation has impacted that. So peace. I'm out. And we'll be posting another video on Friday. Peace.